Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so short-sighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Hello, I'm Stephen and we are in the second instalment of our new summer series, If I Could Tell You One Thing. And the one thing that I'm going to tell you today is make every effort, uh, which may be the kind of thing you're expecting from a finger-wagging preacher of Christianity. Maybe you have an image of, in your head, that's what Christianity is about. It's about making efforts, about doing stuff, about religious duties or the do's and don'ts. Well, hopefully I'm going to dispel that as we go through our message. Or maybe you're thinking, last week it was a wonderful message from Terry about love and grace and life. Where's that gone? Well, let me encourage you, today's message fits with that as well. Well, we address both those things as we look at these verses that were just read to us from the letter of to Peter. Peter, who is writing this letter, is really aware of his imminent death. Not just his death, but his execution. Uh, he's hauled up in a place where he knows he's going to, at some point, be dragged before crowds and killed. And uh, so he's writing a letter in that context, a context where he's probably thinking, if I could tell them one thing, what shall I write down? Which I think would be really appropriate for us as we go through this series. So what is the one thing Peter's trying to say in this letter, in these verses, where he's kind of trying to say that to the believers, to say to them, don't stop growing. Whatever you do, there's a final chance just to keep growing in God. One of the major concerns of his letter is that Christian faith that is firmly rooted must make a radical change to our lives and to our behaviours. Being in grace, having faith in Jesus should make a difference to how we live. But it's important that we get that in the right order, that the faith and grace that we have leads to behaviour and life change, not the other way around. We don't change our lives, change our behaviours to get grace, to get into a place of faith. No, the faith we have in Jesus, the grace that he's so kindly given to us, generously given to us, that should result in change. It's that way around. And the very fact that Terry spoke about grace last week, and I'm talking about behaviour a bit this week, it's a nice way that it's flowed in that order. It wasn't deliberate, but I think is helpful in helping to underline that very point. I have officiated at many weddings. I've helped many couples come together and help them through their vows. And when it comes to the giving and receiving of rings, we say the following, I give you this ring as a sign of my love and faithfulness and a sign of the covenant made between us this day. Wedding rings are not the marriage. They are not the wedding. They're just a sign of what is going on. They're a symbol of the love and the faithfulness and the covenant that is made. And I'd like to just kind of of make a comparison between that and our behaviours. In one sense, the wedding has happened. The covenants have been made between us and Jesus, really just Jesus' covenant love to us. And our behaviour, the things that we do, the efforts we make, 
And just like the wedding rings, they're just a sign of the fact that that wedding, that covenant, that union, that love and faithfulness has been made. Our efforts, they're not the covenant. They are just a symbol and a sign of it. And I'm going to keep underlining this as we go throughout this message. But let's dive into the passage that I've chosen today, into 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, right at the opening of this letter. It says this, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. Peter here, he's saying, you, I'm writing to you, you who have already obtained a, faithful, a faith of equal standing. He doesn't start with saying, hey, you've got to change some behaviours, you've got to make some efforts to receive a standing of equal nature as mine. No, he's saying, I have faith in Jesus, I'm close with him, but I know that you have, as, or has, have already as well. You have already know what it is to have faith in Christ. You know the gracious works of Jesus in your life. He's saying to them, you've already obtained that. It's the same as mine. He, you can look at Peter and the apostles and think, wow, they are super apostles. They are something else. They're something amazing. They're something closer to Jesus than we could ever be. And Peter's just dispelling that straight away. He's like, if you are with Christ, you are the same as me. We're all on the same level when it comes to, us, comes to that. It's such good news for us because whether you are a Jewish disciple living alongside Jesus in his incarnation many thousands of years ago, whether you are like believers today, living thousands of years later, thousands of miles away from Jerusalem, the events of the New Testament, our faith is just as precious and just as valuable. We've obtained it because of what Jesus has done. We have the righteousness of God, this verse says, and we can know Jesus as our Saviour. It's amazing. We are the same standing as the Apostle Peter. If you have put your faith in Jesus today, you can have the same faith, same standing as him. There's no lesser, there's no greater Christians. No, it's about what Jesus has done. That's where our standing comes from. Important to keep underlining that. So we talk about behaviours in a minute. Then verse two says this, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Peter is writing that their grace and peace be multiplied. Not that it will be curtailed by the things that are going to come in a minute. He's not writing saying, make every effort, squashing down the grace and faith and love you've received. No, he's saying the grace and peace you've got, I'm going to tell you some things that's going to help multiply that. Do you have that expectation as you've come to church today, as you come to the word today, that your peace and your experience of grace is going to be multiplied? Maybe as you're coming to church as maybe an unbeliever, maybe you don't know Jesus yet. Maybe you're kind of uh, investigating the claims of Jesus, exploring faith or church because someone's brought you. Are you expecting that may peace and grace may come to your heart today? Let me encourage you, that's been my prayer. My prayer is that not that your faith or your journey might be added to, but that your grace and peace might be multiplied, double, treble, quadruple, whatever you have known so far, that it might come in greater measure. Is your faith in Jesus a faith that multiplies blessing in your life? If it's not, then maybe I could suggest that it's not the right shape. And I would point you to go back again to Terry's message last week. He pointed, painted a wonderful picture of what grace means and the multiplied blessings that come from it. So yes, multiplied grace, this unmerited gift of love and forgiveness for the sinner. This gift that takes us out of the muck of our sin. Everything we've said, thought, done that is wrong and gives us forgiveness, elevating us to the heights of God's very own throne room, into his goodness. God who delights in us, the undeserving. Have, is that being multiplied in your life, the experience of that? Are you having multiplied peace in your life in days that have been incredibly anxious or years that have been incredibly anxious and all kinds of anxiousness that we could feel about our own sin and difficulty and weakness and what does God mean towards us? God wants to give us his peace. Peter's praying that that peace might be multiplied. We might become more and more and more secure that God is a God who is loving towards us who knows our frame, knows the things we've done and sent his son to cover it all over, that we might know what it is to be forgiven, know what it is to be at peace with God. And that we might know the additional blessing, what it is to be at peace with one another as well. Well, also multiplied knowledge that mentions here. Yes, revelational knowledge of who God is and what he has done. I want to keep talking about that as this message goes on. More about what we can know about him, but also more that we can know about him more that we can know relationally, not just revelationary about who he is, but know him personally in a relationship with him. 
In fact, I'm going to pray for us right now that we might know some of that multiplication in our lives, even as we sit under the words today. Heavenly Father, we want to pray as I speak, and as we consider these words, Lord God, that you might invade our hearts, invade the spaces where we're sitting, Lord God, with your truth, with your grace, with your love, Lord, that you might multiply our knowledge, our experience of grace and peace, that it might keep growing. And as a result, we might keep growing and become more like you and live more radical lives for you, Lord God. So I just pray, pray that you would bless each person listening, whether they've been walking with you for many years or have just turned up for the first time, Lord, their ears may be open, their hearts may be open to things that you have to say for them. To them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So these two opening verses, just verse one and two, it's, it's just underlying the fact that faith is something that we obtain through Jesus and we're on equal standing with one another, that there's multiplied grace and peace to come to us. But the good news does not stop there. We go into two more amazing verses in this chapter. And uh, they are like concentrate. I once heard Simon Brady use this uh, analogy for another passage of Scripture. But in one sense, if Scripture is like a cold glass of squash, and it's water that mixed in his wonderful truth, there's points in the Bible where that truth is so thick and concentrated. It's like drinking kind of neat squash from the bottle. I don't know if you've bought squash recently. It's often like you can get four times the strength. You need a tiny little bit now. And these next two verses are like that. They're just concentrated in truth and grace in terms of what the gospel really means. Let me read them to us again. It says this, His divine power, Jesus' divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Amazing, amazing phrases. Each phrase in one sense we deserve a kind of a full-on Bible study. But we're going to zoom through, just pick out a few of them and just see what's there. The first phrase I'll pick out is granted to us all things. That phrase, all things, if you go to the original Greek, do you know what it means? It means all things. It means everything. God has granted to us, given to us all things that we need. There's nothing that he has withheld from us. Even our very life, our very own breath, the next breath that you take, that's from God. The very beating of your heart, that is from God. The fact the world is still spinning, that is from God. Everything we have is given to us from him, comes from him. Anything you're in need of right now, you know where you need to turn? You need to turn to Jesus. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray in his wonderful prayer, the Lord's Prayer, the one that he taught his disciples. He taught them to pray and let heaven come on earth. You want mighty things to happen. You want things to happen on earth as they are in heaven. You pray to God and he is able to do those things. He's the one that we go to for the great and the massive things. The things that ail us, the things that terrify us, the things that cause us anxiety, the things that are well without our, 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 well out of our control, we need to go to him for. But not just those things. He also taught us to pray for our daily bread. So whether it's the big or the little, where to come to God. Whether it's the divine and spiritual, the mundane and physical, to him it is all the same. He is the great provider and we are the great needy ones. We need to keep asking him. The wonderful things, those as we come to him, we know that he loves to give. He loves to give us all things. It says this in Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also with him graciously give us, what? All things. If he gave us his very own son, if Jesus gave himself up for us on the cross, we can be confident that he continues to want to be generous to us, to give us all things. And then what's the next phrase? What for? For life and for godliness. Yes, for life itself, but also for a godly life. And uh, maybe you think, oh yeah, that's right. Maybe just for a godly life, just to do the goody things in life, the boring things of life. No, the godly things in life. What's a God-shaped life? A God-shaped life is one that is radical, that is full of adventure, that brings God's presence to bear in situations, that brings his power to bear on life. Multiply grace and peace should also be multiplied power and presence of God. He wants to give us everything for this life that it might be a full life. Let's move on to another phrase. He has granted to us his precious and very great promises. 
So we talked about the fact that every present blessing we have and everything we need is from God. But the wonderful thing is that God has also granted to us, gifted to us, grace to us, wonderful promises as well. Here, precious and very great promises. We just spent a whole series looking at enduring promises. God's love, to, God's promise to provide for us, promise to be our God. They endure. No matter who we are, whatever circumstances come against us, He is a God of covenant and faithfulness that cannot be shaken and cannot be broken. God promises to forgive our sins, promises to give us eternal life, promises that we will be fruitful, promises to always be with us and promises to come again. These are great promises, again, gifted to us, not because we've done anything yet, not because we've made any effort yet, we'll come to that in a minute, but just because of Jesus and who He is, because of His great love. He's given us these promises so that through them, you might become partakers of the divine, divine nature. There's a lot of phrases there. Let me read it to you again. So by these great promises, so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine, divine nature. Peter's saying here, through what Jesus has done, through his promises to you and me, we can become those who become in nature like God. Very simply, we can become like God. John Calvin, the very famous theologian, says this, it is the purpose of the gospel to make us sooner or later like God. Indeed, it is, so to speak, a kind of deification. It sounds almost blasphemous that we can become like God. If I start walking down the street saying, I am basically like God, becoming more like Him. It sounds a bit strange, but that's what the Bible is saying. As you uh, receive God's gifts and grace in your life, As you look to his wonderful promises, he is changing us from one degree degree of glory to another, making us more like his son, Jesus, making us more like God himself, more of God in you, more of God in me. And then let's have a look at this last phrase. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We have escaped, not because of our merit, but because of what God has done in our life, through the all things, through the promises, we have now escaped the corruption that we have committed, our own sins, all the things we've ever said, thought and done that are wrong. Not just down through the centuries, not down through the, down through the centuries, down through the years of our life, but today, the things you got wrong today, different motives and mucklets in your life. You know what, that corruption, we've escaped it all. And instead we can know forgiveness. We can know right standing with God. And we can now help to escape the sinful desires that have held us in the past. So in four verses, we've just seen, wow, what has God done for us? He has obtained for us a wonderful salvation, an amazing standing in Him in the now, but also going into the future. Peter is so future focused. He said, Jesus is coming again. This is a wonderful truth for us. We've escaped things and into a blessing. And what should our response be? Our response should be worship, should be thankfulness. And that's where Peter goes. He goes to this in verse five and to seven, says this, for this very reason, because of everything I've just said to you, for this very reason, make every effort. Because everything that's gone before, now we make every effort. We don't make every effort to try and obtain those things. No, those things have been given to us. But because of them, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. He's saying, take the things that you've been given and you can now add to it with your faith and with your action. You're not adding value. You're not adding kind of doctrinal truth. No, it's not that kind of thing. It's just adding your bit, like the wedding ring. It's just saying, hey, this has happened and now I'm going to express it outwardly to the world around me. Not to earn what's been given, but because I've been given, changes the way that I'm going to live. Jesus is the instigator, the author, perfecter and finisher of our faith. But it doesn't mean that we're not involved in what he's doing in our lives and upon the earth. We get to be a part of what he's doing, what he's doing in history. Get to be partakers in affecting eternity. We get to play our part. I was at New Day a couple of weeks ago, uh, part of that wonderful festival with thousands of young, young people and hundreds of servers. And they, they produced a video, uh, kind of a roundup of the week of all, everything that happened, of kind of the young people being saved, the pictures of the talk, some of the fun that was going on around uh, the site during the week, just a three or four minute video. At the end of the video, they then listed, they said, thank you to everyone who helped uh, and made it, made it happen. 
And then this wonderful kind of list of names scrolled through the screen at a ridiculous pace. And I slowed it down just to make sure my name was included, which it was. This is 100 shows, my name was there. And I was proud as punch. I was like, yes, that's right. I got to be a part of that, got to be part of that team, got to be part of what God was doing that week. What a privilege. That is just a drop in the ocean compared to the fact that we get to be part of what God is doing in the earth in general. The fact that we might uh, co-labour, we might become his workmates, we might become his family, part of the family business of what he's doing on the earth and including what he's doing in our own lives. We can make effort to come alongside what he is doing. Not that we really add anything, he doesn't need us, but he chooses to include us and that is a great privilege. So Peter takes this. He said, because everything has happened, you can be included. Make every effort. Throw yourself at this. And he then gives us a list of seven traits in which we can do that. Seven traits are kind of chained together. As I've looked at it, I look at various commentators on it. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for the particular chain of why it's that particular order. But it does seem to be just a, a well-rounded picture of what a Christian believer should be. And really it's just making the underline the point that's made elsewhere. That whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we need to do it all for God's glory. There should be a level of intentionality about everything that God puts into our hands, everything that's in our lives to give glory, to give worship to Him and to join Him in what He's doing. How intentional are you about your faith? How intentional about you being with God's people? How intentional about each area of your life to make sure it lines up with the way that God would have it be so you might know His multiplied grace and peace in your life. Well, let's look through these seven. Maybe one of these will uh, kind of uh, resonate with you. The first one was virtue. Add to your faith in God, virtue, or another word translation, goodness. That we are to be a demonstration to the world around us that we are virtuous people, that we are seeking goodness, we're seeking Jesus' way. Not that so we might be puffed up and proud, but to demonstrate what God has already done in our life. That we are freed from corruption. We are freed from our selfish desires and now be selfless, to be generous, to be kind to those around us. And to a world that is watching on, people do look at you. They do look at me. They look at how we conduct ourselves in our families, in our workplaces, even how we conduct ourselves as a church. And we're going to give ourselves to goodness because God is good and created us to be like him. This is what helps us get involved with our social action pro projects. This is what helps us decide that we're going to live differently at work. Hey, if, I've, if I'm a person of faith, if God has done all this to me, I want to live in a way that honours what he has done for me in virtue and goodness. And to your virtue, knowledge. And this is the kind of knowledge which is kind of head knowledge. This is about digging deep into the scriptures. I often meet people who say, I'm not readers. I meet lots of people who are readers, who love to study the scriptures, but often people are, I'm not really a reader or I'm not very good at this, that, and the other. It's like, well, that may be the case. But Jesus will still say, make every effort. Make every effort with your kind of a particular ability and your talents. I work with some very clever people who are much deeper thinkers uh, than me and get their head, heads around uh, kind of um, concepts that I've really struggled to get my head around. But I'm still to make every effort with what God's given me. I haven't got to be them. I'm not comparing myself. I'm just saying, God, what you've given me I'm going to make every effort. I went to university with a bunch of people who were also very clever and uh, memorised tons and tons and tons of scripture. And uh, I was always just a million miles behind them. My memory's just not that great. And I couldn't quite remember where things were in the Bible. But I've made every effort. I've kept reading my Bible daily, kept trying to commit various passages to scripture, tried to make note of where things are in the Bible. And 20 years later, I'm all right at it. I'm still pretty not as good as they were back then. I've made every effort because I want to find more Jesus in the pages. Not so I earn his grace and peace, because I've earned it, because it's been given to me already, I want to dig in and understand it more. These wonderful treasures are so precious. I want to read, I want more knowledge. I also want to be able to defend my faith to others. I also want to teach others and help them understand it too. Are you digging into the word? Are you adding to your faith virtue? Are you adding to your virtue knowledge? Maybe a good way, it's just a good mention right now, is the Emmanuel Institute. 
It's a way where you can set aside time over the next couple of years to say, I'm going to dig in with a bunch of other people into some theology, into some scripture. Yeah, it's going to be a bit, kind of maybe going up a level for me. It might be a bit deeper and, uh, and uh, might cause a bit of a brain ache, but it's worth it because we want to know more of Jesus. Are you making effort with that? Add to your knowledge self-control. It's not a very sexy word, is it? Self-control. In a world that tells you to give in to your desires and your feelings, God would say, no, take your feelings, take your desires and bring them under control. In fact, it's the fruit of being rooted and established in God. More like his divine nature is having his Holy Spirit living and active in your, in your life. And one of those fruits is self-control. That the desires and the feelings that come our way, we don't give in to them. We look at them in the light of what Jesus has done and choose to be different. Jesus says, those who obey me prove that they love me. If your, is your love for Jesus proved by the way that you exercise self-control over some of your sinful desires? That's a real battle. I've had issues in my life where it's taken some time to get over those things. It doesn't happen in one prayer meeting or one moment. Making every effort often means walking through that and walking through in the light with other people. What does making every effort with your sin look like today? Add to your self-control steadfastness or perseverance. We did a series earlier on the year called Resilience as we went through the book of James, which may just put very front and centre the reality that life is full of trials and difficulty. And, and you know what? Following Christ is full of that as well, taking our cross and following him. But we have to be those who follow Jesus in that. Jesus took up his cross. He did hard things. Why? But for the joy set before him. What was his joy? His joy was to have you. And now our joy of having Christ, that means we take our cross and follow him now. Not just out of some weird sense of piety, but because we know the joy before us as well. <clears throat> that this life with its troubles, it's just light and momentary compared to the joy set before us of being with Christ for all eternity. That his promises for us, these very great promises that he's coming back for us. That we're not going to live in this place forever. And again, his Holy Spirit, he comes to walk alongside us. His presence, his very presence is with us. And to steadfastness, godliness. And in one sense, godliness seems to encapsulate lots of what we're talking about today. But let me just go in on one thing, on into prayer. And I was recently in Krakow with church leaders from here and from other churches around our little family of churches getting together for a little conference in Krakow early in the year. And we had a guy called Simon Holly come and speak to us, uh, who's from another family of churches. And he was speaking to, speaking to us about extraordinary prayer, extraordinary prayer. And he was saying, if you want a dynamic prayer life, if you want a wonderful relationship with God, if godliness is about having an amazing relationship with Him, then we want to grow in communication with Him. We want to grow in our prayer life in terms of interceding, in terms of worshipping, in terms of getting before Him. And he said, if your uh, prayer life right now feels a bit ordinary and you want it to become extraordinary, what do you need to do? You just need to add something extra. And he said, you know, making every effort isn't going from zero to 100. It's just taking the next step to put some extra into your ordinary prayer life. And I found it so helpful. And so it's been a helpful exercise I've done a few times over the last couple of months. Just looking at my prayer life, thinking, okay, this is what it looks like right now. And it feels a bit ordinary. How do I make it extraordinary? Well, I've added just an extra thing. So whether that's praying in tongues regularly each day. For me, it's been adding in some singing. Uh, for me, it's also been adding in some journaling. But didn't it all do it all at once? I added in the praying in tongues. I thought, okay, I started doing this regularly. Now that's become the ordinary. So what's the extra I'm going to add now? You know, I want some more time journaling. That's become the kind of the more ordinary now. What do I want to add onto that? Some singing each day. <clears throat> Suddenly my prayer life has grown and become more extraordinary than it was. You know, it's become ordinary again now. And I probably need to go through the exercise again and think, okay, what's going to make this extraordinary? What would it take to take your prayer life from where it is right now and make it extra? Make it extraordinary. What does it look like to make every effort with your godliness, with your prayer life? Add to your godliness, brotherly affection. This word used for brotherly affection here is very familial, family type language. Outside the New Testament, it's only ever used to, uh, used in, uh, uh, to describe households or families. Uh, Peter uses it for the family of God. Is that how you, you view church? Is it a place that you come? Is it a place where you consume? Is it a place you come on your own terms? Or is it a place where you come to be part of the family? to love and be connected with other people. This has been so tough over the last two years. I know it has. 
But maybe now is the time to make every effort to say, you know, I'm going to come back in September. I'm going to make sure Sunday is a priority. I don't choose to go to church based upon how I'm feeling on Sunday night, uh, sorry, Saturday night or Sunday morning. I choose to go because I want to be with the family of God. I want to make every effort to be with them. Maybe it's a term to say, I want to be back in small group, but maybe even lead a small group because being with the believers is so important. And the grace and peace that I've received, obtained through Christ, I want to share with others. That's the basis of our relationship. Not whether they're your people, not whether you've got good chemistry of people, but because we've been joined together because of Christ. Peter ends with his seventh trait, love. This love is like the, it's not like the family love, but it's about the kind of a certain group of people. This love is the indiscriminate love of Christ. The love that we're to show to our neighbour, to our enemy. It's not just limited to those who we love, who are reciprocal, but it's the love that we're to show to the world around us. I guess really in lots of ways it's cool, to, uh, it's a call to mission again, a call to love those who don't yet know Jesus and show them his love. Not trying to muster up love from ourselves, but as we receive God's love afresh each day to go and express that to others. So there's seven traits, it's the seven traits that Peter mentions. Maybe one of them has connected with where you're at right now. And maybe you know God is putting his finger on something else. Maybe you ask, Holy Spirit, what do you want to put your finger on in my life? Well, I want you to make every effort to follow into as a result of all that you have given me. I love that it's Peter that has written this list because when you look at Peter's life in the Gospels, he's a pretty messy guy. He uh, kind of puts his foot in his mouth all the time. There's so many times you read the Gospels and think Jesus is saying one thing and then Peter just cuts across it. You sort of put your head in your hand or roll your eyes and Peter, what are you doing? You're, you're a, definitely a work in progress. But he was a work in progress. A man who made every effort to follow Jesus, to love him and to continue to love and follow him as Jesus returned to heaven. And he lived the Holy Spirit in his life and sought to become more like Jesus. And we see what's happened. He's grown to be courageous. He's grown to be tenacious. And making every effort isn't about being perfect. It's not about waking up tomorrow, finally having it all together. It's not an extraordinary prayer life. Nailed our interaction with church, making sure that every person we meet knows that we are virtuous. No, it's just taking what God's given us and making every effort to follow him into what he's got for, good got for us. Knowing that we will stumble. We will get it wrong at times, but knowing that his grace is there to pick us up, to grab us, to hold us, to help us to go again. There's loads more I could say about the extra benefits of doing this. If you read the last few verses of the passage, go back to them. It talks about the fact that we, um, as we make every effort, that's what stops us from becoming ineffective or unfruitful. As we stay and make every effort, it stops us becoming short-sighted or blind. That if we're diligent with these things, it stops us from falling. As we do these things, we are, for this last verse 11, it says, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This wonderful benefit is that the end is coming. Jesus is coming again. That's one of Peter's big things he want to say to his disciples, to Jesus' disciples. He will say, Jesus is coming again. And if you make every effort, you keep following him, you keep enjoying the grace and peace that's been obtained through Jesus, you're going to be richly provided for as you walk into heaven. I'd love to know what it looks like. Is that a fanfare? Is that, I think, I think of the, the, uh, uh, the, the movie Aladdin and Genie, uh, when Aladdin kind of enters into the city, having Genie giving him kind of troops of all kinds of peoples and flamingos and elephants, all kinds of stuff. This massive troop and parade that comes in. It's like, is that what it's going to be like? I don't know. But there seems to be some sense of fanfare as we come into the kingdom of God, where Jesus is going to celebrate all that he is, but also celebrate the fact that you are in him as well. And you're going to be richly provided for. Sometimes uh, we can be so short-sighted. I don't want to make every effort. It's going to cost me so much in this life. Yeah, it may cost you something now. But you know what? You're going to have everything in the life to come. Let me conclude by saying this. Do not leave this message asking, what should I make more effort in as your first response? That is a response to this message, but that's not the first response. Our first response must be to come back to the grace and peace that we started with at the beginning of the message. George Muller, 19th century believer, said this, my chief aim is to make myself happy in God each day. That should be our aim. That should be make our aim is to come back to grace and peace. That should be our chief effort is to come to that, back to that. 
Because when we're rooted and established in God's grace and peace, we're able to be peaceful. We're able to be gracious to other people. When we reflect that all things come from him, we're able to be generous with what we have. When we realise that all things, all the things we needed come from him, we don't need to be anxious about the lack we currently feel. When we consider his long suffering and patience with us, we can be patient and long suffering others. When we consider his forgiveness for us, we can forgive others. Let me encourage you, grab hold of this grace and peace that he's given you. And as a result, run into the things he's got for you, making every effort to follow him. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Jesus making every effort for us, coming to earth, dying upon a cross, receiving the punishment that we should have done. And Jesus, we want to say we want to follow you into the kind of uh, radical obedience and uh, giving ourselves energy, giving energy to the things you've uh, put before us, Lord God, that we might grow in all these areas. We might demonstrate to the world that you are good and that you have been good to us. I pray for the different things you've stirred in different hearts as they've been listening today that you might help people to walk out no, with no sense of condemnation. Maybe a dose of conviction, absolutely, Lord God, but I pray with joy and hope that, Holy Spirit, you're with us and that you help us in our endeavours in each and every single one of them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.